So without further ado, I'm going to introduce, um, I'm very honored to introduce Jennifer Santry. She works at CABU, which is an organization based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. She's the Indigenous Education Liaison. Uh, Jen attributes her connection to nature, food, and the land to her Lakota and Choctaw ancestors. And she's an enrolled member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, and she'll tell you more about her background. Jen has been involved in food politics, advocacy, and education over the last two decades. She has a master's in nonprofit management from Regis University and a bachelor's of science in zoology from the University of Oklahoma. And she's currently working on her doctorate in education in educational sustainability at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. So we're really excited as part of her dissertation, she's researching best practices for braiding indigenous knowledge into undergraduate sustainable agriculture courses through indigenous place-based and land-based pedagogies. So thank you so much, Jen, for making time. Um, this is the second time Jen is presenting. We're really honored to have you here. And I think this is a really um, interesting perspective and something that we always need to keep in mind as we you know, rethink our nature to the our relationship to the environment and how we engage in environmental protection. So over to you, Jen. I think I have to unmute though. Hold on, uh, ask to unmute. Okay, I've asked you to unmute, yay. And then I have to make you co-host. Yeah. So I'm like, okay. Yay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> Hello to Hamatakwe. My name is Jen Santry. Um, as Karina said, I am based here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. But um, yeah, I actually teach um, in two places, two locations. I teach on the East Coast at UMass Amherst. I'm a sustainable ag instructor. I've been there for 10 years and I teach um, a permaculture class and I teach a few other um, nonprofit based in um, sustainable food system classes. And then I also teach on the West Coast on the Olympic Peninsula, where I've been there for eight years and I teach a food systems and sustainable ag course there. And so um, as Karina was talking about, I am actually wrapping up my doctorate degree in two weeks. Really excited. So I'm um, just kind of pulling the pieces together, but I worked with my Lakota relatives to document stories about their relationship with the land and um, our history, like restoring our food system. So I'll talk a little bit about that today, but um, I'm really excited to kind of bring that to academia and share those stories and talk about those connections, because I think that is really missing in um, sustainability in general, as well as sustainable, sustainable agriculture. So um, very excited to be here. And really, my, my interest is around um, settler colonialism and really um, breaking the barriers and trying to get back to the land and understand land-based education and our connection to the land. So I will share my screen and get started. Let me see, where is my presentation? Sorry, I have like a lot of things open. That was probably not a good idea. One second. Um, there it is. And then let me, and I'm happy, I think I shared this out the last time, but I'm happy to give access to this if anybody wants to check it out. And then I do have a resource list I'll send out afterwards. Um, let me share my, let's just do a slideshow. All right, hopefully that looks okay. So um, as I was mentioning, I, well, as um, I am Lakota Dakota, so I am Satunga Lakota, I am Minnewakan Dakota, and I'm Yankton Dakota. And I'm also a member of Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. And here are some pictures of my family. So the bottom is my Unsi, um, great Unsi Hattie, and then my Unsi um, Eve, and then my dad. And so a lot of what my dissertation is about is telling the story because of um, boarding schools, it broke up my community and my family um, about three generations ago. And so we've been dealing with that and trying to reconnect. My dad, my grandma spoke fluent Lakota and my dad doesn't speak any Lakota. And so you can kind of see that disconnection, which I'll talk a little bit about in our history and how that really impacts, you know, who we are as indigenous. And this is like really a story about me of reconnecting with my family because I had no idea um, about my Lakota relatives until about 10 years ago. And so, um, 
I am been piecing that together and trying to go back to South Dakota quite a few times and just language for really the first time. And so that's happening to quite a few of us that have been disconnected through um, a lot of policies that were instated around the assimilation and settler colonialism. And that includes boarding schools and dislocation. So I do have a video that I want to share with you that I put together. Um, I took a really cool storytelling class. And I think, so one, my uh, methodologies for my uh, dissertation are all based on storytelling. The organization I work for, which is CAVU, um, that stands for Climate Advocates Voces Unidas, we um, base our organization around storytelling. And then indigenous, commun indigenous communities in general, storytelling is really important for us. So I thought, well, I will tell a story quickly through a four minute video of kind of this re reconnection journey to set the stage for you to understand a little bit more about myself. So I'll go ahead and play that. And then if there's any um, problems, just let me know. We walk the path our ancestors walked. I close my eyes and smell the sage and sweetgrass under our feet. I hear faint sounds of blissful grunts and chewing as a hundred buffalo graze across the prairie grasses, carefully harvesting plant relatives and then dispersing seeds and nutrients back into the earth. I feel the heartbeat of Hisapa, the black them with my own heartbeat. The pulse of buffalo breathing, bees buzzing, wind moving ponderosa limbs carrying the scent of vanilla bark. A daily reminder that this land is our homeland. Wash day. At first I was frustrated that my Lexi wouldn't define the Lakota word in English. Copacetic as it should be, nothing seemed to fit. I've struggled with my identity for most of my life, raised away from my community, not knowing or living by cultural traditions and practices. My tune wind has taken me under her wing to teach me these Lakota life ways, to pass them on to my little boys. It took half a lifetime for us to find each other. My ancestors were calling me home. Visiting my aunt and uncle in South Dakota, I learned how to walk in Wolakota and be a good relative. I listened to stories about our family and history. I healed. Cleaned porcupine quills and sorted indigenous seeds from the garden. I learned to bead, smudge, introduced myself in my native tongue, and healed some more. Uncy Hattie used to say, if you were one drop of Lakota, you belong to us. Standing in these grasslands, I reflect on how the buffalo, like our ancestors, survived near extermination. How they too found their way home. Suddenly, buffalo appeared as if they heard our stories and prayers. Uncle looked at me and said, wash day. And I got it. It isn't something you define, it is something you experience. Being in this place, rooted in this land, belonging to this moment. The animals, the plants, the land are our teachers. The bison represent everything that was taken away. The dislocations and disconnections in my family within our communities. The Black Hills reconnect us as the Ocheti Shikowin. This land can bring us back together, heal us, heal me. It was on this journey into Hisapa that I found my story, my Lakota identity, my Ayate, love, hope, and embraced Metakwe Oyasin. Yes, we are all related. Thank you. 
All right. Oops. We did that. <laughs> Hit the wrong button. Okay. Go in there. Yeah. All right. So that kind of just sets the context of where I am in this kind of journey and understanding who I am, but also understanding those nice connections that I want to talk about today. So I really wanted to start with um, one of Robin Wall Kimmerer's um, amazing quotes. Um, you probably are familiar with her, hopefully. She's an indigenous um, scholar and author, and she wrote Braiding Sweetgrass. And um, she has incredible TED Talks. If you aren't familiar with her, I'd highly suggest checking them out. She talks about the honorable harvest, which I will kind of talk about in a little bit, which is very relevant for um, thinking about native and ancestral food systems. Um, but basically she said, the sustainability crimes we face are less about resource degradation and species extinction than of degradation of our relationship with the living world and the extinction of an ethical responsibility for the land which sustains us. And I think that really hits home to kind of what Karina was talking about in us forgetting that connection to the land and thinking about um, kind of going in space and thinking about not only who has been here, right, whose land this was that we are actually on, but also realizing that there's a deeper connection there that we can all learn from and that we do need to focus on reconnecting Indigenous um, relatives and all relatives um, really um, thrive together with that connection. So let me get to the next slide. I thought that um, something that I personally have learned in my own journey is um, understanding the connection between what has happened today within sustainability, within just the world in general, and that how it relates to the history of who we are as a people. And so um, much of what I've learned is that history really sets the tone for everything. And so I do want to share some historical context um, before we dive into more sustainable ag related stuff to help you understand um, how we kind of got to where we are, because it's very related. When we talk about um, history, um, most of it has to do with the land and then everything um, with land and agriculture, um, they're just like intertwined so carefully, you can't really separate the two. So I'm gonna give you a quick history, um, very quick history, and it's very extensive, much more extensive than I'm gonna give you, but this is also specific to the United States or what is now known as the United States, Turtle Island for much of the indigenous communities that um, were here and are still here. So um, I know much of you um, live outside of the US and so hopefully some of this um, resonates or you understand it, but feel free to, to reach out. But I also wanna say within, um, the entire world, there are similar stories of same things that have happened with um, disconnection, um, dislocation, and um, especially um, assimilation and colonization. So this probably parallels with stories that are happening or happened in your own communities. So it's all important for us to know our own history and especially how it um, relates to the land that we are currently um, settling on. So, so this is just um, a brief introduction to that um, and understanding that, you know, pre-colonization before contact with civilization, indigenous communities that lived um, here in the United States, these were the important aspects of our cultures, right? We had creation stories, which are very relevant still today, especially for my community in Lakota. Um, a lot of our creation stories are tied to the Black Hills and that's what I was speaking to in that um, short film. Um, also, we moved with, um, climate. So for us as Lakota, we were very, um, we moved with the seasons, we followed the food, we followed, followed the bison. So um, basically, our relationship was the, with the land was very personal and meaningful and intimate because we, um, that's how we survived. And then we also had um, a very, with that close relationship and understanding that for our survival, we needed the earth to be healthy. So we st steward the land and we um, very much had um, agriculture already in existence. Um, we mostly had it in the way of, you know, berries and nuts and um, all these indigenous plants that we were um, in relationship with and also the bison before 
um, contact, but we also continued that stewardship of the land, um, even though, um, as you'll see in a little bit, there were constantly impacts to that, right? And then we also had complex societies, and we did have um, in existing families, and for us, it was Yo Oyate, which is nation, Tiospe, which means we had um, smaller family units, usually around 200 to 300 um, unit, person units. And um, just interestingly enough, just to, to talk about this, I did ask my uncle, you know, what was sustainability in his eyes, and those initial Tiospes and thinking about um, living in that society of 200 to 300 people. And he said, um, he read actually a study for sustainability the most sustainable communities were that size. And he said he smiled because he realized that it made sense because within it, you can actually take care of that many people, like you can keep track of them and you know everybody within that structure, like 200 to 300 people. Is that, that's you know still a lot of people if you think about it, but you're able to take care of your people. Um, when you start getting bigger than that, like the cities and societies that we have now, um, there, that's why we have issues with you know many people being homeless and many people not being able to um, have access to food, um, healthy food. So um, it's just interesting concept to think about when you think about sustainability. And then really important for us is tribal sovereignty and um, just understanding within the United States that we have, that we are not um, just another community, that we actually are ourselves a sovereign nation and we have our own governments. And so that's really important to recognize and that we did establish treaties, even though all of them have been broken with the United States. Um, but I will talk a little bit more about that, but we do have these treaties that um, were established. We were established as we are still sovereign nations and that um, our governments and communities are set up um, as if we are our own entity or nation itself, right? So everything I feel like starts with settle or colonialism when we start talking about climate change, when we start talking about agriculture, um, it really goes back to the land and thinking about how that land um, was taken forcefully. And um, most communities that were on the land that, you know, you might be, if you're in the United States or wherever you are, you, you might not be indigenous to the land that you're on, or you might be. <laughs> so even now, me in New Mexico, I am not indigenous to this land that I'm on. And I think about that often. And I think about all the hardships that indigenous communities faced when they were forced off their land. And that was that major disconnection, right? They were, they had these very spiritual and alive connections with the land, and then they were forced off the land. And um, that's why you see so many hardships in these communities, um, indigenous communities today. And so there was really a policy of land theft. There was um, an idea built into um, settler colonialism that really wanted to focus on taking land from indigenous communities. And this was around policies called the Doctrine of Discovery, Manifest Destiny. Um, really the idea was that um, there was this idea, right? A mindset within Euro Western um, settlers that they thought that if you weren't using the land, if you weren't growing food actively on it or agriculture in their definition, that the land was free for taking. And so they really wanted um, to develop the land. They wanted it to be utilized and farmed. And they really saw it as a worldview of owning and managing and um, having ownership is the biggest thing about the land. Our connection as indigenous people with the land is much different from that. We don't own it. We don't think about it that way. We think of Unsi Maka, which is grandmother earth for our culture as alive, an entity that we need to take care of and that we're both you know, there's no hierarchy that we're both here thriving together. And it's important for us to understand there's this reciprocity and mutual resource for each other. Whereas the Western European mentality um, is that we need to own that land, that we need to buy it and utilize it. And hence why sustainable ag has developed in the way that it has and the problems that it has today. Here's a um, very quick and um, kind of busy um, slide on the history of many of the things that have happened in our um, in our history here in the United States. But I, you know, I don't want to simplify it by any means, but there, you know, there were quite a few things that happened that set 
um, precedent or that set um, the standards that we have today. And most of it had to do with the taking of land and water rights for um, Native people or Indigenous people to the land. And so I'm not going to go into detail with all of these. I do recommend, um, I don't think I have it right here. There's an incredible book, um, Dunbar Ortiz, um, that I will send out to everybody that has to do with um, the Indigenous perspective of um, our history. And so I would highly recommend diving into that if you did want to read more about the various events that happened. Um, but I'm going to go through them in more of a like, theme-based um, instead of event-based and talk about the specific things that happened within those events. And so overall, one of the biggest goals was systemic starvation. And um, the idea within the Western mentality was if you wanted this land, the only way to get people off the land was either to move them forcefully or to starve them out. And that happened a lot. And especially in when, not especially, but within my community as well, I have lots of stories that I was told um, by elders and relatives um, regarding, you know, different communities, Nakota, Dakota, Lakota, we all make up the Acheti Shikoan, that um, this happened repeatedly over and over again, where communities were starved out. One big example of that, as you can see in this picture, are the bison or the buffalo, and how um, they were exterminated um, from 30 million to around 200, um, and then we almost lost those relatives. Um, the idea was if they they noticed, especially for Plains um, tribes that are Plains um, indigenous communities like the Lakota and Dakota, um, if they took away their food source and destroyed that, then they would be um, probably helpless and then they would need, you know, some kind of um, government entity or some kind of system to step in, right, to support them. And then they would be at the beck and call, which is, you know, assimilation. And that's exactly what happened. So they killed the buffalo, the bison, which really destroyed that relationship for us with that, um, you know, Pate, um, Oyate is Buffalo Nation for us. And without them in our um, livelihood, because we relied on everything of the buffalo for our survival, then we did have to um, rely on government um, commodities. And that's where that kind of built up. And they came in and offered treaties and said, okay, because you don't have the buffalo anymore, or, you know, not only that moving us in very um, difficult lands, like South Dakota is not the easiest place to farm and they wanted us to farm to survive. Um, so just like losing, you know, continuously losing the land that we had, losing relatives and the food systems that we had, and then quickly um, flipping that to have to rely on the government and these commodities to survive. So that's a snapshot of that, right? The other thing too is um, across um, the U.S., the restrictions on hunting and fishing and gathering. So that's a good relationship to think about too with um, our food systems is that then we're still fighting and many communities are still fighting for that, right? The ability to fish um, salmon or whatever, um, even the welling that happens in communities, coastal communities, um, gathering, not having access to our land anymore. For us in Lakota, we don't have access to the Black Hills that was stolen from us. We can't, I was driving through the Black Hills with my relatives and you, we can't harvest sage. It's illegal. And it just sounds preposterous that a very important med medicinal plant for us um, we can't harvest it on our own homelands. And that happens all over the place. Um, so just are things to think about that you might not have thought about before when it, it's related um, to settler colonialism in our history. Here's a picture of how um, much the bison range shrank. So you can see um, the original is in green. And then as of 1870, it started breaking out and um, smaller and smaller and smaller until the ranges in 1889 with just a few hundred left. Um, some maybe a thousand, the counts are different, um, but you can see that there's a substantial drop in the amount of buffalo that we had. Um, the one thing to also think about too is if I were to show you a picture of um, the US and the indigenous um, um, land that was, um, over that same range, you would also see it shrink. And it would look very similar to this, to where you can start seeing us as Indigenous people um, having smaller, smaller land until it's allotted out, until it's um, these tiny little reservations in comparison to what the original was similar to the bison story. And I feel like, um, as I said in my video, our story 
really much aligns with the bison story in describing that. So some other impacts, as I talked about, removal and then um, creating these reservations. This is the Choctaw Trail of Tears, which also has to do with my um, my other community, which is um, Choctaw Nation, and how um, we're one of five that were removed um, during the Trail of Tears from relatively the east coast or east eastern area of United States all the way to Oklahoma. And um, thousands and thousands of our people died. Cherokee has the same story. Um, and now we are all located in, in um, what is now known as Oklahoma and um, forced onto that land. And so that story is um, very similar for the Navajo or the Dene people. Um, there's stories throughout the United States of similar things where people were forced on reservations or sometimes they called them concentration camps where they didn't even really have access to land. Um, so that was happening over and over again. And then um, the treaties that we had in place, we had specific treaties that were set forth. Um, one of them was um, treaty rights for us as Lakota to the Black Hills. And um, of over 300 were made right between this time of 1778 and 1871. All of them have been broken. And so um, today, you know, we think about trying to get the Black Hills um, back. There's ongoing litigation with the United States in trying to get that back. In fact, there's now over three, I think it's $2.5 billion that they've set aside that keeps accumulating with interest rates that they try to buy, um, try to give us um, as Lakota people to buy Black Hills because it was illegally taken. And um, our people refuse to take that because we want the Black Hills back. And so it's one of the it's a story to kind of to read about if you're interested in learning more about this. Um, and there's many stories like this. And then the limit meant that um, once we were giving reservation land, that think, and one way that um, settler colonialism and that Western mind frame of owning land was to come in and divide it up. So allotment means they made individual properties for individual families or people within um, reservations or within indigenous communities. The issue with that is that we always saw land as communal or collective as a community. We felt that we were connected to that land. We never thought about it, one as ownership and we never thought about it as individual thing. And so that also kind of shifted our mindset and um, that assimilation process of realizing, you know, just that break of community and collectivity um, but also that break with the land and losing more land. And you can see we lost another 90 million acres, which I've been told is about equivalent to all of the acres that are currently in national parks and forests. So that's pretty substantial um, loss. So it was another hit after the reservation system. We lost more acres um, to indigenous communities through this process. And so here's some example posters you might have seen back then. Um, so basically it says uh, 138 million acres in 1887 to 48 million acres in 1934. So a 65% reduction. Um, so just understand like as a land-based culture, you continuously um, lose the land and it, it, it still happens today. And then we had boarding schools that were taking place and boarding schools forced native children into schools that were ran pr primarily through religious-based organizations like Catholic, in schools and then government-based. And the idea was, again, assimil assimilation. So if you take these kids away from their parents and then you cut their hair and make them wear um, the clothes that you want them to wear, the idea was to erase them like as native people. So um, get rid of the culture, get rid of the language. They were actually um, a lot of times abused or punished for using their own native language. I have lots of stories from my own relatives that recall that. So you can see where that um, really that intergenerational trauma, um, and it is intergenerational trauma, is set up and continues forth where um, within my own family where we lost our culture and our language because of boarding schools. And then we also, um, the U.S. had a termination period. So the idea is like after, and I guess the whole point in this, by the way, is showing you that colonization wasn't just like this one event. It was this ongoing process over decades and um, centuries, essentially, or um, you know, 
decades and decades and generations and generations. So the idea wasn't just, you know, they just kept hitting us, right, with things after one after another. Um, the termination period was the idea to, again, assimilate by sending Native people to the city. And it was a break, it, you know, it was offering them um, better jobs and, you know, pay, which, you know, turned out for a lot of um, Native people who went to the urban areas, that was the case. But, um, they did that anyways. And so that, again, broke up communities and broke up family units. And um, now we have quite quite a Native population um, in various urban areas um, trying to reconnect with their identity and their culture. So here's just a snapshot of all the Indigenous communities, um, Native communities to United States, um, Dakota, Lakota, up here in South Dakota, um, Choctaw is in Oklahoma, if you're familiar with the states, but it's just an understanding of, um, I always think about California because California has some of the most terrific stories about um, assimilation and colonization and loss of communities. Um, and if you look and see how many indigenous communities were initially there and kind of know the story about what it's like today, it's shocking. So just kind of understanding um, the rich history of indigenous people that were here prior to colonization. And the also realization that we are still here. We still very much is, exist and we still have communities and culture um, thriving. And I think that gets lost. You know, when you talk about history, we think, um, oh, native people, indigenous people are of the past. And, um, and they also, you know, the way we look, we get stereotyped, um, especially in the movies in Hollywood. And, and we very much have um, these cultures and these vibrancies and, and this personhood, you know, we still very much exist and we don't like to be stereotyped. <laughs> okay, so that brings us to um, what I wanna talk more specifically about today in getting into sustainable ag and understanding ancestral foodways. Let me just ask quickly, Karina, can you remind me how long I have? Um, yes, um, you have, uh, we have uh, the session until 12. So okay. maybe another like 30 minutes and then we can open up for question and answers. Perfect. Okay, just wanted to check. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I think it's also really important to understand these worldviews, right? So, um, and Western, so Western worldview, if you think about science, if you think about um, academic institutions, if you think about what I just told you in history, there's really the separation from nature um, and who we are and this ownership mentality. And so it's like thinking about even within um, natural resources and um, land conservation efforts, um, even within the environmental movement, there is a lot of um, us, not really us versus them, but separation, like not thinking more hierarchical, like thinking human up here and everybody else is below us, right? Um, and so in thinking of controlling, like owning or figuring out how we can fix the solution. Um, when you think about indigenous perspective, however, there is no hierarchy. Um, within my own community, it's called Mitakwe Oyasin, and we think about um, everybody within the same family unit. We're all related, even um, things like rocks and mountains and places. We don't think about, um, we think about them as just as important. Um, and we also don't think of owning them or controlling. We think we're in relation together, that we must work together. So there's a different kind of respect there. There's this mutual um, symbiotic, you know, this this relationship where we realize that we both need each other, that we are both important um, within our world and we exist together for a reason. Um, so really the indigenous world view, it, it, it involves um, this relational aspect, um, this respect, reciprocity, knowing kind of if you think about the, the earth, like what you take from the earth, you need to give back to the earth. Um, that we'll talk a little bit about that and how we um, gather and how we plant. Um, it's very cyclical. So we think about even our, we have something called seasonal rounds, which I'll talk about, or even cyclical, we think about things instead of, you know, trying to break them out. Um, even when I was talking to my relatives, everything was interconnected. Um, so, and then holistically, we try to 
we try to like bring in all aspects of whatever things that what we're looking at. Futures thinking for us is seven generations. We have a philosophy of thinking seven generations out. Um, so we're always thinking long term. And oops, let me move this. I can't see. And um, spirituality and cultural beliefs are very much a part of everything that we do. Um, in fact, spirituality was something that I kind of had to learn the difference between spirituality and religion growing up um, in a household that was in the Midwest in the Bible Belt and realizing that wasn't really for me, but it's very different from spirituality, understanding who I am as a Lakota person and what this all means for my culture. So language is also very important. I talked about Mitakule Yasin, meaning we're all related. Um, I have um, found that other cultures um, or other indigenous communities have similar systems as well. So I've been learning stories from um, my Diné. Um, I have two interns that work for me that are Navajo or Diné, and they tell me very cool stories that um, are so similar to my stories, but still very distinct to our own culture. So that's something to also realize that we are indigenous to this land. Um, and we, um, but we have our, there's like, hundreds, there's like over 570 recognized, 62 recognized tribes. And so we all have very distinct languages and cultures and um, ways that we also, and stories, creation stories, all of it, and ways that we connect to the land. But we all come together in this, you know, relational view of how we feel about the land. And um, that mindset of um, Mitakwe Austin is very similar and different, but it's called different things. And then ceremonies are really important. Um, I learned so much like through interviews with my relatives about how ceremony and what ceremony means. It's not just like I had envisioned like, you know, the ceremony. No, it, it could be as simple as giving thanks or asking permission from a plant when you harvest them. Um, it could be just, you know, smudging, like starting your day in a good place, talking to your ancestors. Um, all these things to us are very important practices um, because it brings us back to the community and that uh, relationality aspect. And then a real it's this realization that we have this responsibility, this greater responsibility to be good relatives. Um, we also have, you know, sacred sites. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that. Like the Black Hills are very sacred to us. Wind Cave is where um, our emergent our emergent stories, um, creation stories originated from, and all of us as um, different indigenous communities have those things. So we share, but we have very distinct and um, specific stories and relationships. So this is a um, this is kind of the start of talking about um, seasonal rounds. But I just wanted, again, to remind um, everybody about these creation stories because they're fundamental to how we see the world and um, how we set our values moving forward. And so the difference is how that kind of plays out in when it comes to agriculture. If you take that mindset I just explained to you and then put that into agriculture, you start understanding a little better about um, how like ancestral foodways food sovereignty kind of plays over here and how this mindset of, um, you know, even sustainable ag can kind of go both ways, but how this mindset of, you know, industrial agriculture, um, profiting, um, kind of exploiting the land and just really trying to, you know, grow food as much as possible to get, you know, those are very different concepts and worldviews. So within indigenous worldviews, um, for agriculture in particular, my uncle would say, we didn't have agriculture. He doesn't really like that word. He always says, we were just in existence with our food systems. And it's true. We followed the food patterns. You know, we, we, we had sugar bushing, we had elderberries and we had, um, you know, various that, and black elk. I mean, we had various trees that we, um, we used to um, get our medicines from, you know, we kind of followed the seasons and, um, um, Temsla, which is a wild turnip, you know, that was only available usually in June. Like, so we, we started creating our calendars around these plants that were available. And then also the bison following them and having these very spiritual and um, ceremonial hunts. Um, so, and it was more about hand cultivation. We didn't have plows. Um, we didn't really use animal fertilizing. Um, so there was just, you know, there was this domestication of if cattle and sheep and all this happening, we did not have that happening within our communities. 
um, we just had this relationship with the hunting. So just understanding even like um, the difference between women and men. And wisdom. Um, we're very much a matriarchal society, um, whereas um, that's very different in European values. So you can see this European mindset was really forced on us. And so it's just interesting um, to see how that continued to develop into some of this, the agriculture problems we have today. I wanted to share um, this relational um, view of the honorable harvest. And um, this is not a great slide, but it kind of gets, gives you an understanding of all the aspects. And this is Robin Wall Kemmer who talks about this. She's a Anishinaabe, Anishinaabe, and she talks about um, land as home. And this is, again, having to do with this worldview of looking at the land. What does land mean to us? And so with an indigenous worldview, land means all of these things. There are ancestor connection. Um, they're, they, they're, they help us heal. They, they contain our stories and our sources of knowledge. Um, they are our identity. And um, we have this moral responsibility. They're sacred. Um, land is just part of our life. Um, and we just have this very close connection to it, right? But if, then if you look at the Western view, land is really viewed as property, as capital, profiting off of it. Um, you know, I've even heard the term ecosystem services, and I've learned, I used to, like, in sustainability, I taught in sustainability for 10 plus years, thought that was a good thing, but if you kind of think about it, it's always thinking about what can the land do for me, like, that even that term alone can be problematic, um, looking at land is just a natural resource. So you're always trying to profit, take, take, take. So that's just a different um, mindset. And this really plays into thinking about climate change because a lot of the problems we have today are based on this mindset. So I wanted to share some seasonal rounds with you because I think seasonal rounds are like one of the coolest things. <laughs> and they also are really impacted by climate change. So seasonal rounds are created um, through stories because we are at least in Lakota and Dakota, we are an oral history culture. So we didn't record anything, but we understood the environment around the season. So this is a cool understanding here. Um, these mostly are documented and created when they look like this by um, academic um, people that go into communities, um, like anthropologists or whatever. So um, I wouldn't say that our communities are creating seasonal rounds that look like this, but we do have some artistic versions I'll show you in a bit. But it, it helps you understand like how we followed the food systems and understood what was abundant. It was about observation. It was about understanding. When I um, interviewed um, Luke Black Elk, um, and he's um, with Cheyenne River, um, Sioux tribe. He talked about, um, you know, people like trying to connect people back to sugar bushing, which is like harvesting um, um, maple syrup and tapping the tree and that he would start talking to people and they're like, well, when do we go? Like, I want to know when to go. Like, when is it ready? And he was like, it's not like that. Um, you have to observe the seasons. Like it doesn't just, it's not like I can tell you a date to like go out and sugar bush. It's, and he told me this, like, long story about like sitting out and just starting to notice when temperatures temperatures start changing or um the smells or watching different animals and birds come in and and then the switch of certain things in the season that let him know that it's getting close and then realizing the temperatures are getting to a point and watching how the tree is reacting with this environment it was like this entire beautiful story it wasn't just okay, on this day uh, in the spring, we're going to go in sugar bush. No, it's this intense and, and intimate relationship of understanding all these things are happening. And that is leading to you going sugar bushing because it's ready. You can't make it happen. It was a really cool story. And, and it was told over and over again with so many different things. Like so many people rely on when the salmon, like salmon is very sacred to um, a lot of the Northwest communities. And you do the same thing. They, they, and all these elements that come into play for when that, that salmon is going to run so they can have that relationship and understand when they can, when's the best time, right? When's the best time to go and fish? When's the best time to harvest? So you're not impacting that plant, that, that animal community to where it will disappear, right? Um, so these are all playing into this understanding of how um, we need to be in relationship with the land, but also, um, you know, I hate to say environmental conservation mentality, but thinking about how 
we can learn from indigenous communities when it comes to climate change. So here are some really cool examples. I'll, I'll just go through a few of them. Um, here's one for the Salish community. Um, so you can see how they differ and, um, and what they follow because of their location and what's important to them. But you can see they build their seasons around what plant is available as well as like the bison hunt and when deer are available and when fishing takes place. So it's really cool just to see that and understand that. Um, the other cool thing to do when I was thinking about plants is um, a lot of Lakota names for our plants because we're trying to get that back. Um, they're not just one name for a plant. Like a plant might have five or six different Lakota names based on um season based on what that plant offers us based on flowers based on based on place names so it's really cool that it's more observational in um creating this relationship and calling it not just this random name connect to what the plant is or maybe named after like some scientist that found it it's really about understanding that plant and what um your relationship is with it so here are some other ones that are more drawn um or artistic, but again, just understanding for the different communities what it might entail. Some of them include like basket making or something specific to culture. Um, for us, it might be quill work when we harvest quills from the porcupine and create art out of it or galia. Here's one for my community that was really cool with the language included, um, even getting really specific about when stories are told. Um, talking about nuts and when they're collected, when you have specific ceremonies or dances, um, the moon patterns, it, all of these things are important. So you can see their relationship with the land. Here's another one that uh, is from Standing Rock. And this is a really cool study if you want to. And they taught them ecological same thing season around. But what they did is they went into Standing Rock and talked to elders about um, how seasonal rounds have changed and they have dramatically. And you can think about that. We are seeing changes all the time with earlier uh, springs or, you know, ice melting earlier or, um, you know, longer summers or hotter summers. So that shifts, you know, these plants and animals that they're used to seeing at a certain time. So there's all these seasonal rounds are starting to shift climate change, um, which is pretty substantial. So they're trying to help these communities document that so they can watch how they shift. Um, so it's really interesting. So here I'm going to dive into just some food system stuff and talk about how we view um, indigenous, indigenous communities um, really have this relationship with different um, plants. We call them plant relatives. And so for some communities, especially here in the Southwest, corn. Um, we have amazing creation stories around corn and, and rituals and um, ceremonies about corn. And right now in New Mexico, um, in and around Santa Fe with the Pueblo communities, I work specifically with um, the Northern Pueblo communities and um, corn, corn days, like these feast days and corn um, stories where everybody's invited, even if you're not part of the community, to come to the community to celebrate around food. It's really cool. Beans, all these beautiful different types of um, beans, not realizing too, like the diversity and um, thinking about these indigenous foods. And there's just not one kind of like, you know, maple syrup bean or whatever black bean there's tons of beans that are related to so many things within our cultures and um a lot of us have been carrying these seeds forward and they're ancient they're amazing and those those seeds carry stories right so they're very important squash we have a lakota winter squash which is really cool um the three sisters you probably have heard of it's very important it's actually not it like it was um, traded or brought in by story from other communities into our culture as Lakota. We did not um, grow corn typically um, or have a three sisters connection, but it's still a beautiful story regardless. And thinking about polyculture and permaculture and how um, plants really thrive together. And the idea is that you have corn and beans and squash and um, they each provide for each other in a certain way, either as a nitrogen fixer or as um um, a mulch or shade 
or as a way to grow tall for like the beans, the stalk of the corn can really support the beans. Um, and um, so it's really this beautiful mutualistic relationship where they all come together and then you can also cook them together in a, in a perfect meal. So some, a really cool story. Um, talking about salmon, um, the importance of salmon. There's amazing stories about salmon that I just learned from Nez Perce tribe. Um, they have um, really taken on this energy movement. Um, they realized that these electric companies were coming in and building dams along the river and destroying the salmon population that is like vital to their culture. They train all of their people on how to install solar panels. And so the solar panels have been going up across the res and then um, reaching out to other communities and trying to create this network where they can take the power away from the electric companies. They thought, well, this is the only way we can make it work. And if they took that power away, then they would have to take those dams down. So it's a really cool story about what people are doing. I, I used to live in... Um, the Seattle area closer to the Olympic Peninsula and they have an incredible story about the Elwha Dam being removed and the salmon coming back. So just thinking about different ways to approach it. Um, these are um, various plants and foraging tactics, um, ways that we, like for us at Temsilla, um, which is this um, wonderful, beautiful flower, but it's a, a tuber. Um, you have these different types of plants that are important that are already found in nature that we um, harvest. Um, fire and landscape management, I just wanted to emphasize that. Um, I think that always gets lost and especially last year here in New Mexico, our fires were out of control um, and thinking about the importance of fire in restoring the land and that relationship in a Cultural and ceremonial for indigenous communities. And that also um, helped control different plants. Not, I hate to say control, I shouldn't say control, but help eradicate certain plants that um, maybe were overtaking, like um, like weeds and things like that, that were overtaking um, our food systems, right? And now nobody touches anything, right? They don't, they want it to be left alone and let nature do its thing. And what happens is that um, the landscape has been dramatically um, changed. And um, so that relationship has been lost. And so it's coming back in a lot of areas, which is really cool. Um, so this is kind of what I was going back to when I was talking about Lakota food names and more than a name, um, understanding, you know, what, species it is, but where does it grow and what plants are around it, um, harvesting, like what are the, te the te techniques of harvesting. Um, with the honorable, honorable harvest for us, we go up to a plant, um, we understand, you know, um, Robin Rothmer actually talks about when you see a plant for the first time, you don't harvest then, you actually look for other plants and realize that there are existing other plants and then you start kind of this long process of, um, talking with a plant and understanding that it's okay to harvest that plant in stage, you age, know, you know, you don't want to harvest when it's with child, they say, when it's seeding, because that you want that seed to flourish. You don't want to harvest a plant that um, is struggling. So these are all things that we want to think about when we talk about um, agriculture. That doesn't happen today. You know, there's people that just go out, they'll pull sage right out of the ground, pull out roots and everything. That's not how you harvest sage. You, you, there's this long list of protocols that you do that you, you, you meaningful harvest and you, you observe and you understand what point that that plant is in their, their life and if they're ready and if they're okay with you harvesting. And then you harvest just a little, like maybe a third of that plant um, or even a fourth of that plant or whatever that plant can handle, right? You don't pull the plant out. So there's all these techniques and things um, that we can learn when it comes to um, growing within agriculture. Um, that's really important to kind of pass on to the next generations. Um, a lot of this is experiential and hands-on and understanding context, you know, specific plants and places. One thing that my uncle, you know, gets really frustrated with when it comes to agriculture is it's all based on these, um, these, these uh, short-lived um, annual plants, right? Even like tomato seeds, all of it, you're replanting constantly. And those things are not indigenous to this land. And so he always likes to look at a long-term 
perennial indigenous kind of um, plan for whatever he's so whatever area that he's designing he's like what was here originally what should be here what can we help flourish that already has connections with playing the other cool thing he told me stories about the bison and this mutualistic relationship they have with the land um he's talking about you know how the bison curls its tongue around grass gently harvests it in a way that helps that native grassland thrive they don't pull the plant out like cattle and um, a lot of domesticated animals like sheep will actually harvest all the way down to the ground and they'll just keep eating and eating and eating even horses um, do that and so it really hurts the land but if you think about the the animals and um, like bison who have had this relationship with land for millennia they know how to take care of their land they know not to take it all the way down they know which plants to harvest they also are harvesting plants and spreading seed and so they're regenerating that um that need of grass and diversifying it so it's a really cool story to think about um and um yeah that's why they're a keystone species that's why we need them um traditional phenological knowledge is thinking about cycles of plants and so um what is related right like it's kind of like those uh, ecological calendars or those seasonal rounds thinking larger like how do these plants interact with their environment how do they interact with us um what does that mean within the life cycle of the plant and how you um harvest you know what is it feeding how is it through animals so those are all things that are really important thoughts um that are quite frankly, missing altogether from agriculture practices. Um, so these are these these are things you can kind of dive in later, but um, that you can pull from um, the honorable heart and um, apply them or they should be applied when you think about sustainable ag or when you think about working with plants. So again, giving thanks and understanding the importance of um, respect for plants. Um, we offer tobacco or a song um, or some kind of prayer whenever we we um, and we ask permission before we, we take from plants, um, leaving some behind. So making sure we don't harvest everything, don't pull the roots out, um, making sure that we are careful in how we dig so um, we don't destroy the plants, the root system and all the other vegetation around um, replanting a lot of times when people take timsilla, which is a root or tuber, they take a part of it and then they replant it so it can continue to flourish for future generations. Uh, making sure that we are thinking about every, all the logistics within that site and the other species, and then thinking about how we can contribute by sowing seeds or leaving a little compost or um, throwing seeds out and helping again these plants to flourish. So just some ideas. Um, and really that worldview of understanding being a relationship with land and helping your plants and being a good relative. So here is the honorable harvest um, takeaways, right? So never take the first one, listen for the answer, ask that um, question to the plants. Um, is this okay? Can I have permission to harvest you? Um, make sure it is. Um, take the time, it's just meaningful um, respect, right? Take only what you need, use everything that you actually do take, um, and then be grateful, minimize harm, share what you've taken with others, um, rec reciprocity, make sure you return a gift, um, and then only take what is given to us. And this is a really cool um, thought I pulled from, it's not the best uh, copy because it was on LinkedIn, but I love this. Um, and thinking about regenerative agriculture and these kind of hot topic names right now, everybody's about regenerative ag and even organic agriculture and um, all these different topics and, and names. A lot of the things that I teach about in my classes, right? Um, and just understanding, you know, the differences in that there, you know, indigenous people have been communicating with plants and connections with lands way before settlers were here and they know how to do it and so just um understanding that place-based knowledge and ways 
and thinking about it within culture, our belief system, and that ancient knowledge, right? And so um, it's just a really cool way to address like all these hot topics of things to do and thinking about the answer's been here. We have these answers and um, we just need to 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 um, listen, I guess. <clears throat> so this is ultimately um, my journey were pulled from um, my my short film, but you know, show you here's my uncle with um, an elder where we um, she actually lost her house and um, she lives on Rosebud Reservation. And so he designed this amazing landscape architect um, drawing for her that would include these perennials that um, include also what was on the land before um, before it was stripped of that, but also um, the, that are important for our ceremonies and cultures. And then um, it's gonna be a women's cultural center, which is really cool. And um, they just um, pitched in and bought her a teepee, a, a traditional teepee. And um, I got a really cool video of them um, raising the teepee, which is amazing. So now she has a home and she has grandkids that can live in the teepee. And that's in South Dakota. Um, these are porcupine quills um, that me and my aunt, my uncle collected off the side of the road. We, we there was a road kill. And so we we um, collected porcupine quills and, and um use them for um, creating quill work, which carry our stories, and that's our regalia. Um, this is a picture of me talking to an elder, the bison. This is um, one of the stores there, the Lakota language. Let me see how much more I have here. I think I'm almost, okay, I have a lot. So I want to just um, wrap up. There's a lot of pictures in here. We talked about land-based knowledge. I just want to show you this really fast. Um, this is kind of what I learned from my experience. It's more of it's like what I talked about with wash day, like it's experiential. You, It's not something you define, it's something you experience. So that's ultimately what land is. Like it's getting back to the land, it's being on the land, like the observations I was talking about, the understanding of our rel relatives, all of this, um, this holistic approach, this is the pedagogy. This is like what I was seeking in my education that I want to incorporate into my own teachings. So um, it was a really cool full, full circle thing. And um, one other thing I learned from my relatives too is when it comes to climate change messaging, I think it's important to think about how we message. So a lot of the messaging is around like, let's fight climate change and combat and um, go to war and and he really cautioned against that because it really um, emphasizes that dualism between us and nature because he reminded us that climate change is just a reaction of mother nature, Unsi Maka, to, you know, um, dealing with abuse and neglect for so long. This is her way of saying um, things need to change in society. We are not living sustainably. And so climate change is not the enemy. Climate change is, um, is something we need to address, but we have to take care of the earth. However, really interesting enough, I was talking with my um, Navajo interns and they told me a totally different story. And they were telling me how climate change is considered a monster in their, their culture. So it's really interesting. I think um, we can all take different things. I mean, they they like compared it because they have uranium mine issues. So their story intertwines when climate change intertwines with their history with uranium mines and what that did to their community. And our stories intertwine with um, the land and understanding um, in different ways. So it's just interesting to think about it and messaging. I've also had other people who are like, want to be climate warriors. And I think that is cool. And, you know, what water warriors. Um, so I think it's just perspective, but it's something to be thought of. So I want to just quickly say in the last few minutes before we have questions, um, I want to share with you the climate challenge. And um, you're more than welcome to reach out to me about any of this stuff that was kind of a whirlwind. Um, and hopefully you learn something new. But this is um, a program that's part of the organization I work with, Kavu. And I told you we're a storytelling organization. So we basically have curriculum and we also have a climate, um, it's a, it, the Climate Innovation Challenge is a video production um, 
it's a video challenge. So if you're in age groups, and for us, it's um, third grade through 12. So the cutoff is around 18 years old. Um, you could submit a video. And I think right now we're going to do away with the limitation. So it's no longer two to four minutes. It's just up to four minutes. So you could do a TikTok um, of some solution that you would like to see in your community. And we have an awesome competition. And then um, we award um, cash prizes. So, but the idea is that we work with school districts. And so I work specifically with um, Native students and I go into Indigenous communities and try to develop, help youth, engage youth in climate action, which is kind of what you're here for, right? So we want to um, share that with you. If you want to participate or learn more, please get in touch with me. Um, kind of do this around this entry point of like, what are you passionate about? What are you good at? And then help you come up with a climate action plan. Um, I just want to show you like some of the things that Native youth care about um, and how that, you know, relates to different things they want to see um, in their community. And this all is around like with planning, um, creating action plans within our communities. So um, I'm going to get past this. There's my contact information. I am on LinkedIn. If you want to connect, that would be awesome. Um, here's information about CIC. The, um, the challenge, and you can actually sign up for the curriculum. It's free if you're interested in doing that. And um, I'll go ahead and pass it back to Rina and get some questions and see if we have a little bit of discussion. Thank you so much.